this is Misty Edwards and I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about my own journey and how I survived my teenage years. I remember being a teenager and all of the desires that were coming to the surface in my heart, specifically the desire for identity. Who am I? What am I about? Who do I identify with? What's And the second thing was, what's the purpose of my life? Why do I exist? Why am I here? I had all these questions. I wanted to be accepted, but I wanted to be different. I wanted to you know, have a click and blend in, but I wanted to stand out. I had so many tensions and so much friction in my soul as a teenager. And I also remember just this hunger for God. I would look up to the sky and I would say, I know you must be there, like you must be real, you must be there, but I didn't want to just believe what my parents taught me. My parents were uh, pastors, so I'm a preacher's kid. I wasn't content at just believing what I was told. I needed to know for myself. So I was a ravenous thirst as a teenager. I was very restless, very much a seeker. And I think there's a lot of young people out there today that are in that same kind of position. You're a seeker. You're looking for something. You're looking. You've got this uh, question in your heart, whether it's acceptance, it's uh, beauty, it's success, it's God. It's all these longings that the Lord himself has put in your heart. And I remember being a teenager, I was taught, you know, early on by well-meaning people that I was supposed to repent of these desires, repent of these longings, and the longing to be beautiful, the longing to be great, the longing for purpose, the longing for success. But what I came to realize through some teachings and some various things in my life is that actually God himself put these longings inside of you because they're supposed to be like a magnet that pulls you to him. I found out really early in life that nothing else satisfies. Yes, we have many secondary desires. We have many, many dreams and they're good dreams. We want to impact society. We want to change the world. I wanted to do something that mattered, something that I could die for. But at the end of the day, nothing could satisfy my soul. That desire was pulling me to the transcendent one pulling me to the invisible, pulling me upward and inward to where God himself lived. And I just remember looking for purpose and meaning and feeling like the writer of Ecclesiastes. When I was a teenager, Ecclesiastes was my favorite book of the Bible. So I realized I'm a very happy person. <laughs> But I, the, I, I loved it. I identified. I could take my heart to the heights and it all felt like vanity to me. Like what under the sun has any meaning when at the end of the day you die? So I had to come to grips with I got to get above the sun. I got to get a hold of the one, the creator, the designer, the one with the blueprints of this life. Because only he can, only he has the blueprints. Only he can say you did the success. Only he can say you're beautiful. Only he can say you did it right. Only he can say yes and amen to your life. And only he can satisfy. You know, most, most of our life, we're live, we live on the inside and only he's there. So I, very early on as a teenager, even though I was wrestling through so much, you know, you wrestle through your identity uh, with beauty. Like I could never attain beauty. That was such a struggle for me as a teenager. I hated the way I looked. I'd look in the mirror and I, I mean, it was a daily just self-hatred, even though I was a Christian even at the time. And I knew that God had, you know, my mom would quote, you fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and in my soul, I'd kind of roll my eyes and think, oh, God messed up on this one. I was wrestling through these kind of what seemed like very vain issues. Well, at the same time, my soul was longing to transcend, longing to connect with something that meant more than just who I knew or who liked me or how I looked or even what grades I got or what my teacher said about me. I wanted something more. And there's only one solution to the something more, and that is the ultimate purpose of our lives. The ultimate purpose, the reason you're designed, the reason you're created, every tongue, every tribe, every people group, the reason we exist is because there actually is a creator, a designer, someone who had a plan. And the reason he created us is because he is love. And love wanted to be poured out. And the primary purpose of our lives is to return that love. God the Father loves you and loves me the same way that he loves Jesus. The exact same way it says in the Gospel of John. If this is true, this is success. 
This is beauty. This changes everything. This is the ultimate dream, the ultimate vision of my life, is to receive love from God and to give that love back to Him. Not just in emotion, but in action, through living a Sermon on the Mount lifestyle, through service, through humility, to do things when nobody's looking, to act like God is actually real. You know, as Christians, if we believed half the stuff we're told or half the stuff we say, we would be radical beyond measure. God is watching my heart and every little cup of water that I give, every time I serve, whether it's serving my parents or it's serving children, it's, it's, he sees it, he sees the meekness, he sees the humility. And this, as small as it seems, this is where the greatness begins. These are the people that are gonna inherit the earth and the future society that God is building to rule the planet and the universe. This is the main primary purpose of your life, is to go from an egocentric baby crying, me, 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 to be conformed into the image of love, which is a slain lamb. That's who God is. That's the purpose of your life. So when you feel the pressure, when you feel all the tensions that come and all these longings that seem to be unfulfilled, trust me, they will only be ultimately fulfilled in God. And yes, He wants you to have a happy family. He wants you to find healthy relationships. He wants you to fall in love and make money and all those things. I love those things. But at the end of the day, you leave those behind. You die. And there's one set of eyes. There's one heart. It really is just you and God. You and God and all the service and all the evangelism and all the outreaches, everything that we're doing is about bringing more people into this union. And I've found real early on in my teenage years that it sounded easier than it was to live for love, to try to love God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. When I was a teenager, I got cancer for the first time. And I remember that that really that really propelled me into my journey of I've got to actually do this thing and not just say it, not waste years. You know, so many of us waste years and years of our lives in the futile and things that don't really matter. And the Lord is, I feel like he's leaning over the balcony of heaven in this generation and he sees the restlessness, you know, like Jacob who was so restless and it said he wrestled with the angel. Well, this is a generation like Jacob, restless. We need to see the face of God. We know there's more. We don't want religion. We don't want rhetoric. We don't want pain repetition. We've tasted all the kinds of physical pleasures, drugs, addictions, all kinds of things that leave you empty in the end. It's God himself. The emptiness is actually evidence that God is making a space. He's pulling this generation. Come, come to me wrestle with me, ask the hard questions. So maybe you don't even believe God exists. Come, wrestle with it, ask the questions. Get in the conversation. Let me reveal myself to you. I feel like God is in the face of this generation saying you're not gonna be satisfied until you connect with me. One thing is needed. And yes, many other things are very good and God will bless, but one thing is needed. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And as simple as the sound, all the law and all the prophets hang right here. And here is where the encounter happens. And here is where the fire is found. And I'm just praying that any teenagers out there, if you're just feeling restless, maybe your parents are trying to send you off to some summer camp or you just, you don't even know why you're watching this video right now. I'm just praying that God would quicken your heart. I don't care who you are, I don't care what your story is. The Lord himself is chasing you down. He's hedging you in. He's drawing you after himself. And I just pray that even a little sentence would prick your heart. Lord, I just pray right now for anybody watching this video, I ask that for the atheist, for the, the uh, Satanist, Lord, anybody that's watching this video, for those who were raised in the church like I was raised in the church, for those who are just hungry for more, Lord, I ask that you would take a generation and you would draw them unto yourself, that you would make us more than a people of words and rhetoric, but a people of reality. We want reality, that we can love you. And I wanna encourage you to come to the Fascinate Conference. 
here in Kansas City. It's at the end of this month. I know it's only a few weeks away, but if you're within driving distance or if you can get here, get here, no matter how restless you are. It's a good thing to be around other people who are asking the same questions. I hope to see you there.